The American Original. For over the last 10 seconds, the sharpest Satoshis, the best Bitcoins, the hardest cryptocurrency talk. We'd like to welcome Derek J. Freeman from Bitcoin hey. Philadelphia. How's it going? Megan Lords from Bitcoin Not Bombs. Hello. And Will Pangman from Bitcoin Milwaukee. Thanks for having me. The Bitcoin Group is sponsored by Alpha Lion Technologies. Alpha Lion Technologies, they don't make the altcoins. They make the altcoins of the future. Learn how to make your own altcoin at alphaliontechnologies.com. Issue 1. Overstock.com accepts Bitcoin. All it took was a few pizzas, some hotel rooms, and locking the Coinbase and Overstock teams in a room for a week. But they got it done. Overstock.com is now the first major online retailer to accept Bitcoin directly. They made over $124,000 on the first day. The snowball has started rolling. Who's next? Derek J. It's got to be Walmart. They're the biggest. They're the baddest. Except for, like, Amazon, which is dragging their feet for some unknown reason. I think Walmart would be the next obvious choice. Once they see Overstock doing something, they've got a pretty similar business model. They could just go for it. Megan Lords? I think we're going to see someone like eBay maybe pick it up. Um, again, I, you know, I, I would expect Amazon to really be considering it, though. I know you can still get, you know, you can use gift and get a gift card for Amazon with Bitcoin, but uh, there's really no reason for them to not just accept it directly. Will Pangman. Um, well, I'm hearing rumors that it'll be Newegg. Um, that seems to be coming up, but whenever Snoop Lion or whatever he's calling himself releases his next CD, that's a that's a little bump. Um, when is that? That that should be coming up pretty soon, right? Um, but I also heard the CEO of RoboCoin. Uh, I forget which news outlet it was, but he was being interviewed and he mentioned Overstock and Starbucks as possibly being next. So I'd really like to see a real world retailer, especially one as ubiquitous as Starbucks. Um, that would really kick the adoption into high gear. I like how it's become a race already. By Overstock, by Overstock throwing in their hat so quickly, they've made it clear to everyone else that this doesn't take months and months. It's not a big plan. You put some guys together and you get it done. Amazon, Walmart, especially Walmart with such a low amount of money, with such a high overhead, like you think they would get on board with Bitcoin and start saving probably hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of dollars in credit card fees. If you were a credit card company right now, would you be worried? I think so. How many more major retailers before we don't care anymore and it's not a big deal? What type of business would you like to see take Bitcoin? Derek J. I'm going to say it's about 50. That's not an entirely arbitrary number, but I think for most people, uh, you know, once there are 50 big businesses that have accepted it, they've heard of at least 10 of them, and they're like household names, and they say, okay, I can get on board with this Bitcoin thing because, you know, Tide or Kraft or whatever accepts it, and so I accept it now too. Um, what type of businesses would I like to see accept Bitcoin? For me, convenience stores. This is one of the no-brainers. I want to be in and out, and Bitcoin makes that possible. I don't need to make change. Uh, I don't need to talk to anybody. Just give, show me that QR code and let me get out of this store. Megan Lords. Ah, uh, let's see. I don't know that it's maybe a, I can put a number on it. I think it depends on who starts taking it. If someone like Walmart gets in, I mean, we're gonna see I think massive adoption of Bitcoin really quickly. So I don't I don't necessarily have a number. I I think it depends on who's gonna be adopting it first. As far as who I'd like to see start taking it, I really still want to see like small local businesses taking it, I, or and like farmers markets, things like that, like getting, getting you know the the people in your local community community involved. I don't have anything against Walmart, you know, taking Bitcoin. I think that's awesome, but uh, I, I really got love for my small businesses here, and I'd really like to see more of them taking it. Will Pangman. I think, uh, you know, I want to kind of bring everything back down to earth a little bit. I don't really see any of these really major players uh, taking it, you know. Um, Patrick Byrne, the CEO of Overstock, is he's kind of a no-brainer when it comes to being attracted to Bitcoin. You know, he is um, involved with the deep capture investigation from, you know, the crash of 2008 and stuff. 
um, check that out. It's interesting stuff, deepcapture.com. But, um, yeah, there are going to be a lot of these big players. You know, we've seen everyone be cautious who shouldn't be, like Western Union. Like, um, you know, Amazon has, and eBay have dipped their toes in the water, or so they, you know, there's been leaks of rumors of stuff like that. Um, the big box stores are not coming very soon either. Uh, it's, it's unfortunate, but um, what I'd really like to see, the businesses accepting Bitcoin, are the vendors for the kinds of businesses that already accept Bitcoin, so we can kind of close the loop here. Um, you know, these retail outlets can accept their Bitcoin payments from their loyal customers. You know, you mentioned Overstock's success in just their first 24 hours. And Overstock can then pay its uh, suppliers, the vendors that it looks to, to source um, the materials for, you know, how they run their business. You know, you could take Overstock, insert whatever business that's already accepting Bitcoin, you know, the Bitcoin store and, and all these places. Let's close the loop and we'll start to, uh, then we'll see the dominoes fall. I think we've got some really good ideas here. I think Starbucks would be fantastic. Newegg is definitely a candidate. I think the answer is five. Once we get about five major businesses that accept Bitcoin, and really more than you can list off in a normal conversation, when it becomes you have to choose between Walmart or Target or Oversock, which one you're going to mention, that's when it's going to be over, and it's just going to flow like dominoes. The small businesses will come in line. Basically, if you think about Square's business model, and the little thing that you're going to put on top of your phone so you can accept credit cards, all of those businesses, farmers, markets, individual small restaurants, any kind of entrepreneur, a tax man, any kind of service that you would offer, strength coaches, soccer teams, all of those people should just accept Bitcoin with their phone. You don't need a little attachment on top and you don't need to pay Square their fees. But the next big company to accept Bitcoin will be Netflix.com. Issue two, miners ditch ghash.io over 51% attack fears. Mining network ghash.io neared the magic number of 51% this week as Bitcoin miners took to Reddit and social media in droves warning people to change pools. If they had reached 51%, they could have reversed transactions, double spent, or even prevented other miners from mining valid blocks. Could a 51% attack really happen? What would happen to Bitcoin? Megan Lords. I thought it was interesting. It kind of showed the voluntary nature of the Bitcoin community realizing the threat that a 51% uh, attack would pose, and they self-regulated. I think there's more incentive in keeping blockchain, uh, or I'm sorry, keeping Bitcoin uh, preserved the way it is instead of uh, breaking it down. Um, you know, maybe there, you know, so there will be some short-term gains if they get past that threshold, but I still think there's more incentive to not go past it. If it does happen, if there is a 51% attack, I think uh, the market's going to respond to that. I think we're going to see better coins come out, or uh, there will be a fairly quick fix because of how percept perceptive the community is, too. Will Pengman. Yeah, um, you know, I was kind of annoyed more than anything by this. I, you know, I, I do think it's a, a question worth pondering, and it's interesting the behavior of you know these miners. They're they're, they're kind of entrepreneurs too, um, so it's easy to glom on to you know, the gorilla in the space at the moment or whatever. Um, you know. I know of a lot of solutions that are being worked on right now to decentralize mining pools and things like that. And there are some options out there already. And, you know, if, if this is a big concern to people, they should consider going to peer-to-peer -peer pools and things like that. Um, certainly important questions for the health of this long term. But, um, yeah, you know, it's interesting. I wonder, uh, there's certainly a lot of investment, a lot of, you know, big investments going into mining in the last several months. And um, you wonder kind of... Uh, kind of the rigs that are out there that are able to pull this, uh, pull this off. Um, I'm fascinated by the whole um, the arms race with mining, uh, but it's something I still have a lot to learn about. So um, it's not something I'm very concerned about, a 51% attack. I'd like to not see one attempted, for sure. But, um, you know, I think the survivability of Bitcoin is, um, um, you know, it's in good shape right now. Derek J. It's possible I could have missed something, but yeah, I think a 51% attack is absolutely possible. However, 
uh, what would happen to Bitcoin is people like me, if I see a 51% attack happening, I'm switching right over to some other altcoin. I mean, I'm not interested in Bitcoin anymore once I know that they could be double spent, reverse transactions. So I am probably like most miners and other people on the Bitcoin network who say, hey, wait a minute, I want this currency and payment network to stay useful and valuable. And if a 51% ruins that, then me, even as a miner, I'm, I'm not going to be interested in doing that. But let's not forget and attack centralization like it's some bad uh, thing on fakes. Because uh, centralization, when voluntary, this has been a very good thing. When there was a fork in the blockchain, the centralized nature of these mining pools actually helped correct the problem sooner than would have been possible if they were totally decentralized. So uh, I think it's imp important to uh, remember that centralization is not always a bad thing. And it's not so bad to have um, an oligopoly where only four or five country companies control the entire market, which it seems what it be, seems to be with the Bitcoin mining pools. I like to Will Will's idea of the peer-to-peer -peer mining. Perhaps if the mining pools reached 30 percent or 40 percent, they'll just break into individual mining pools, 2A and 2B, just split into parts and then continue mining. It also seems like the mining pools should just be capped at 40 percent. If you get that level of control, it's dangerous for everyone involved. And I don't really think that uh, ghash.io profited by going above 40% and, and threatening the market. I think they probably are going to lose long term. Exit question. Why not just cap the mining pools at 40%? Will Pengman. Um... I don't know. I'd rather see, you know, um, more of a consensus on uh, protocol improvements or something. You know, th we know these things are coming. Bitcoin has changed since its inception a number of times. Um, I'm sure a, a, a fix at the core that could be agreed upon, um, you know, by the majority would be perhaps a better solution than mining pools, capping things, you know. Um, it, I don't know how easy it is to change a mi change mining pool, so, because I'm an inexperienced... Uh, you know, aspiring miner, and um, it's if it's costly or time-consuming, then that could be a concern. Derek J. No, it's anti-freedom to put a cap. Let the market decide. Megan Lords. Yeah, I, I was going to say that. I, I think we should let the market decide. Um, you know, I, I I think the network wants Bitcoin to succeed more than it wants what it can gain out of you know, a 51% attack or something. And, you know, it, it, we've already shown that the miners can self-regulate. We'll see. This episode was sponsored by Let's Talk Bitcoin. Let's Talk Bitcoin. Check out their exciting new podcast contest and vote for your favorite. Find out more at letstalkbitcoin.com. Issue 3. IRS Reviews Bitcoin. If the IRS believes Bitcoin to be a currency, they get to tax it at 40%. If Bitcoin is simply a capital asset, it's only taxed at 24%. What will the IRS do? Will they leave all that money on the table? Or will they give Bitcoin a bump by calling it a currency? I ask you, Will Pengman. Um, yes, yes, they're going to, yes. Uh, but, you know, I don't know if it's a top priority at all. I mean, the IRS has a much bigger job lately um, than Bitcoin regulation, if you will, or Bitcoin taxation, uh, you know, pursuit of, of all that. I'm sure um, there will be some concerted effort on their part, and probably already is, but I think they're more focused on some other newer laws, you know, that... Uh, have expanded their payroll quite a bit and um, their workload quite a bit. So uh, they'll be consumed with the issues that precipitate from the health care law, and I don't think uh, Bitcoin is really a concern of the IRS to the point where, you know, every single one of us has a lot to fear because this is a gray area, a complete gray area. And typically, the way the IRS treats gray areas is you're a criminal retroactively. Uh, so we'll see. Um, I just, um, you know, sometimes that's not the case. Sometimes, you know, in the case of the Internet, um, Congress passed laws to allow it to flourish first, if you will. And, uh, you know, there are some proposals in the, in, you know, forthcoming for um, legislation for Bitcoin in, for the same respect, you know, a kind of a leave-it-alone law or whatever. Um, but, yeah, it's, uh, they're going to they're gonna be all over it. Brace yourself. Derek J. 
Yeah, what will the IRS do? Well, if the IRS um, is smart, they'll tax it at 40% and call it a currency. Of course, you mentioned that's going to give Bitcoin a bump, but as all Bitcoin users know, I mean, as we think about even f preparing to fill out a, a 1040 or some sort of uh, self-reporting about uh, Bitcoin earnings or holdings, uh, it's impossible. We all know it's impossible to, to give accurate information about this. Even if we wanted to give at perfectly accurate information about uh, Bitcoin holdings, appreciations, it would be impossible for any person to be accurate about that and to know that he's accurate. Thus, it would be impossible for any IRS agent to know if this is accurate. It's a big problem. And what I encourage Bitcoin users to do is not report. Megan Lords. Oh, yeah, they want the money that they think is theirs, of course. I, I think they're going to be, uh, they're going to want to tax at 40%, but there's a huge enforcement problem. Like, how, if, if Bitcoin users can't, you know, fill out the information, I mean, they're not going to be able to track people down. They'd have to hire a giant team to track down this information, to look at the blockchain, to, you know, link everything up. And it, actually, they'd have to get the NSA involved, all of that. I mean, I don't know that the IRS has the capacity to do something like that. Uh, even though they may they may attempt to, I'm sure, because again, you know, they they see that there's a lot of you know money to be stolen. But I don't know that Bitcoin is used by enough people for them to make it a priority. Like Will said, uh, they have bigger things to focus on, and uh, this is, I, I think they're kind of testing the waters at this point and trying to figure out how they can get their hands on the money. But uh, it's it's going to be a struggle. I agree, and there are so many issues like lost wallets or stolen bitcoins or in you know fake stolen bitcoins or fake lost wallets I mean there's so many issues and so many people did lose their wallet they don't know how to move their bitcoin around they legitimately have made horrible mistakes and it's gone and I presume you're probably gonna have to pay taxes on those lost bitcoins or not I don't know we'll have to see exit question if the IRS doesn't call Bitcoin a currency, how many years before they change their mind? Will Pangman. Uh, he seems to be frozen. Go to me. Go to me. Derek J. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's uh, they. I don't. I don't see that happening. Um, Derek J. It doesn't matter what the IRS does or says. Screw them. Megan Lord. I was going to say, it doesn't matter if the IRS says it's a currency or not. It is a currency. Uh, it, it doesn't matter if they declare it a currency this year or 10 years from now. There's nothing. You know, they don't legitimize Bitcoin. The users do. The answer is three. Three years. Issue four, Bitcoin Botswana. One woman in Africa has named herself the Bitcoin rep for Botswana and is attempting to bring Bitcoin to her small African nation. Is this the future of Bitcoin? Individual adopters leading entire countries to Bitcoin freedom? Will Bitcoin Botswana be a successful model for others to mimic? I ask you, Derek J. Gee, I hope so. She really made a splash. We were talking about it at last night's Bitcoin Philadelphia meeting. So obviously, the, the news is making the rounds. And if more people can follow her lead, the whole world will be a freer place very soon. Megan Lords. It really shows how Bitcoin can help people all around the world who are, you know, su suffering from poverty or other problems that are often caused by their own governments. So, uh, it, I mean, it, it's a great story. And one of the things that she said in the article that I thought was very interesting is it gives people the sense of self-control over their money, and that's very empowering because people don't care, don't put all of their money into banks in third world countries. Oftentimes these banks are, you know, hours and hours away and Bitcoin eliminates that problem. Um, let's see, another thing. Uh, uh, and also I, d I did read a criticism of it. People were like, oh, well, you know, why are we, you know, why, why should she be concerned about, you know, getting Bitcoins to people in Botswana? These are people who are illiterate. Well, in 2012, this group called One Laptop, One Child distributed tablets to these children in Ethiopia uh, with no instructions given. They just gave them the tablets and they taught themselves how to use the tablets. 
Uh, within a week, they were using them fully functionally. Within five weeks, they had hacked the tablets to enable the cameras to work on them that had been disabled. So this whole kind of paternalistic idea that, you know, the third world isn't, you know, maybe ready for some of these technologies because of these reasons, I, it, it's really, uh, you know, it, it's kind of ridiculous. People... People understand how to do things. They can teach themselves. And yeah, I do think you're going to see a trend in this happening. It, that was one of my favorite stories. It's my favorite story of the year so far, I think, for 2014. Will Bing. I, yeah, I completely agree with Megan. You know, when that uh, when news of that little uh, experiment came out that you referred to, Megan, that was really thrilling for me to read, too. You know, I love hearing stuff like that. Um, and it just, you know, the creative uh, power and and the real, true intelligence of human beings, you know, and the full potential, you know, any human being can uh, actualize a, a kind of fullest potential. So um, that's exciting, and, and this is apparently what uh, this woman is doing too, you know. I think what's important to look at, though, is how many of the Botswanans know of her. That's the thing I want to know. You know, we all in the West, certainly thanks to Reddit and many other outlets, and we're talking about her on the Bitcoin group, and I think um, to encourage people like this and nurture them, and maybe there can kind of be some like emissary um, effort, I think there already is with all the conferences around the world, uh, to, to recruit more of these ambassadors. But the, the most important thing to me is how many of their people um, know of her and, and can she serve them directly? I think she can, uh, you know, and it's great that we all know about her, but... Um, uh, she, you know, I'm sure if she posted up a QR code, she could get a lot of resources to uh, make a, you know, build the awareness of what her project is for for the people in Botswana. And I think we need to see this in all kinds of developing nations. Um, a lot of places we are. I'm interested to see what 2014 has to bring for Argentina. If you remember, my prediction a few weeks ago was um, that Argentina would be the the big story, not Russia, not China. Well, this is a good point, and it seeks into the exit question of how should people spread bitcoins? Should the same tactics be used in the developing world as in the developed? Do you think that she's going to have maybe a local meetup at a pizza place or an African equivalent of a pizza place, get everyone together, give them very small amounts of bitcoins, set up wallets on their phones? I'm not sure. I mean, that, that sounds reasonable. If it works here, it's going to work there. Derek J.? No, uh, as much as I regret my answer, the same tactics should not be used in the developing world as the developed. I think that you know they're they're totally uh, different economies and they they require uh, different setups. And then besides, there's the the benefit of once uh, Bitcoin gets adopted, you know, next year we've got a, a variety. We've got big uh, box stores that accept Bitcoin, and we've got developing countries uh, where you can get fresh milk from a goat. You know, so it's a it's a wide range of um, acceptances. Uh, but how should people spread bitcoins? Look within yourself. See what you're doing in your life. Where are your dollars going? And try and change that to bitcoins. If you're doing that and everyone's doing that, the world will be bitcoin friendly tomorrow. Megan Lords. Yeah, we're going to be really surprised by the different creative methods that people come up with to spread the idea of Bitcoin. Uh, in, in all other countries, uh, what works for us isn't going to work for them. Um, you know, we don't, we don't need to be sending, you know, white knights over there spreading the salvation of Bitcoin to these people. Like, they, they understand what's going on in their own economies better than we understand what's going on in their economies. So I think we're going to see a lot of different approaches coming, and I don't think there is one best approach to spreading Bitcoin. Will Pengman. How should people spread Bitcoins? I think you're looking at it. Um, you know, Bitcoin Botswana, that's a great model. Everything we're doing here, you know, the media that's coming out. Um, I really love all the new podcasts. I love seeing the mainstream media cover local meetups and stories about Bitcoin. You know, the billboard thing, I know I bashed it a little last week, but, it, you know, that's great. All that stuff is great. So you're watching it in action. Um, should the same tactics be used? Yes and no. Uh, I certainly think live in-person networking like meetups can can work in the developing world. I mean, why not? What's the problem with Bitcoin adoption in the developing world? It's they're not wired up. There's no there's not enough Wi-Fi. So, you know, I, that's a huge problem. Connectivity in the developing world 
Uh, there are some countries that, you know, are, are probably more developed than certain African nations that have 4G wireless throughout their entire country and things like that, and that's, that's good. You know, if we could see that, you know, in some of these other countries, I think with the technology available today, um, a, a little bit of entrepreneurial spirit and um, maybe some uh, fundraising can, can get that done. Uh, but that's the key to uh, adoption in the developing world is connectivity. So I'm excited to see what kind of non-Bitcoin related, um, you know, ISP solutions, open source ISP type of projects that are out there. Um, I've got one in mind myself, but, you know, it's, um, that's an exciting space to keep an eye on to spur Bitcoin adoption in the developing world. The other six billion need internet. It's interesting right now to think about it from a technology perspective. All they really probably need is a mesh network where they could form a local Wi-Fi group and then having Bitcoin wallets pre-installed on their phone or easy to install through the mesh network. Technically, it's not very far, but then culturally, understanding Bitcoin, there's probably a lot of layers there. Moving on. Oh, Google's hiding my menu. There we go. Special Issue 5, Breaking News from PR Newswire. Veritel launches Bitcoin with BitPay. Veritel is a registered payment institute for high-risk merchants, including adult entertainment webmasters. Bitcoin can now be used to buy adult entertainment online anonymously, servicing more than 50,000 online businesses, a.k.a. porn sites. Veritel now accepts Bitcoin. How about that? Megan Lords. I'm surprised this happened. This hasn't happened sooner. I mean, porn and Bitcoin. That seems like, yeah, this is like perfect. I mean, <laughs> I think it's great news, and uh, yeah, it, it fits perfectly with what uh, I think Bitcoin is about. It's about freedom. Will Pengman. Yeah, Megan's right. Um, this is one of the best present use cases for Bitcoin. I mean. It's not a crime to, you know, enjoy some of these uh, indulgences. And a lot of people would like to preserve their privacy from friends, family, their, you know, job, their coworkers, their bosses, their future employers. You know, I mean, with all of the, you know, surveillance options out there, even to the layperson, um, Bitcoin is a huge advantage for preserving privacy in, a, in you know, what even the most fat bureaucrat would call legal ways. So, uh, yeah, it's exciting. You know, uh, um, what was the number of websites that they managed? That's huge. It's, 50, uh, I hope it catches on. 50,000. My goodness, Derek, yeah. Yeah, the adult in, uh, entertainment industry in the U.S. is about $13 billion, of which about $5 billion are legal, according to Wikipedia. So there's a lot more um, around the world. Uh, so this is going to be big. I mean, this is the GDP of the U.S. is about 15 trillion, um, but the it's so compared to that, it's a drop in the bucket. But this is still pretty big. I disagree with Will's point that this is going to help improve privacy. I'm sure, as Will is well aware, Bitcoin can be tracked if uh, people aren't being extra careful to take steps to improve their anonymity. They're going to leave a marker that is permanent, uh, attaching them to whatever sort of porn they enjoy. So they better be careful when they decide to uh, send their Bitcoin across the wire. Well, yeah, just to rebut up. Derek's point real quick, uh, you know, of course you need to take some additional steps, but I was presuming that, you know, the folks who would conceal this from their future employers, their current employers, their family members and friends would be sending this, you know, from maybe a new wallet every time, or, or at least a new address within a new wallet. And the forensic effort for examining the blockchain uh, is, a, is a huge um, undertaking, and most, you know, employers wouldn't invest in such a thing or even know to do so, and certainly friends and family can't do that. So it's really easy to be completely private from those types of folks. Uh, you know, the, the other, the powers that shouldn't be, on the other hand, uh, that's another story. I also think this is an opportunity for the, the porn industry. They've led the internet in so many other ways from online passwords, encryption, uh, streaming video, that maybe adding remixing services to the, the, the Bitcoin chain so that when you send your Bitcoins to the porn company, they automatically remix it for you as a service to offer you additional privacy. 
and maybe this becomes in vogue and the rest of the Bitcoin companies start remixing automatically because it just seems like a no-brainer. Once we really get this money mixed up like cash, it's going to be much, much harder to track. And while not totally anonymous, pseudo-anonymous, if you get enough layers in there, it's generally good enough. We don't have that many questions. We do have one question about Litecoin as a more efficient payment for merchants. Derek J? I'm for it. Megan? Yeah, I'm for it. I don't, I don't see that it would be that hard to implement as a payment system. Will? Yeah, I'm all for altcoins. I just don't see, at least for the, you, the commenter's question, uh, a greater use case for Litecoin than Bitcoin for merchants. Faster I mean, confirmation I, time. Yeah, I, I experience instant confirmations stations. with BitPay all the time. If you think about gas stations, uh, the Litecoin block time, I believe it's about four and a half minutes. If you were at a gas pump and you didn't want to go inside the store and you scanned the QR code on the pump, money went in, pump starts running right away, Litecoin might be more efficient for that. I mean, they, one of the Bitcoin problems seems to be the transaction time, the requirements for confirmations. Um, I think zero should be fine, but a lot of people are still set to six. Three is a little more fair, but if we're talking instantaneous gas station convenience store type transactions like Derek was talking about, Litecoin or one of the smaller, faster coins might have a major advantage. Let's see, any more questions? None it's worth questions. mentioning while we're talking about small business adoption that uh, this week, Philadelphia Brewing Company became the first brewery in the world to accept Bitcoin. Yes. Uh, and that's a very exciting thing. So I'll be celebrating. I encourage everyone in the Philadelphia area to come down February 1st. We'll be celebrating at the brewery. And it's likely there will even be a Bitcoin accepting food truck uh, across the street. So February 1st, mark your calendars, those of you in the Philadelphia area. That Derek, sounds I'm great, Derek. Congratulations, Philadelphia. Derek, I'm Sorry. embarrassed that Philadelphia beat Milwaukee to the punch on this one, um, but I'm going to preempt my prediction that we'll have um, three breweries, microbreweries in the state of Wisconsin accepting Bitcoin by the end of the year. Oh, that's a competition I can get down with. We do have another question from Splutta. Since becoming a Bitcoiner, I'm paranoid when installing new software that it will contain some sort of keylogger malware designed to steal my Bitcoin. How paranoid should we be about this, and what precautions are reasonable? Derek J? Be paranoid. Use Tails Linux. Uh, study security. This is important. This is your money and your future that we're talking about. This is not a game. Megan Lords. Yeah, I, I think you should be as careful as you possibly can be. Uh, you know, use paper wallets as much as possible to store your Bitcoin. Don't store large amounts on your computer. Will Pangman. Yeah, I you know one of the things I saw a need for right early on in my um, Bitcoin exploration is a need for you know for mainstream adoption that people learn a little bit of what I guess I'm calling hacker sense. You know, I agree with Derek 100%. Learn security. Well, and it's funny that all the Windows users who have been allowing these wide open machines, these unpatched machines for years, it's now coming home to roost. If you're going to keep your money on a computer where it can be sent away, like an email, in a single keystroke, no matter how much money it is, almost instantly, and it's gone, it might be time to get a Mac or to run Linux. There are other options for you, as well as sticking to the normal softwares, not installing strange software. Um, it's a whole new world, and yeah, you should store your Bitcoins in paper wallets. You should have two-factor authentication. Uh, most of the websites, like BTC-E or Coinbase, have two-factor authentication, especially for withdrawals. Uh, it's time to be you know, more secure. You know, Let's we see if we have another comment or question. Go ahead, Will. Yeah, I was going to say, you know, the thing about Bitcoin for mainstream adoption and even just for, you know, those of us who have an appetite for such a thing as Bitcoin already and, and, and come to it, um, there's, there's definitely a need to, uh, you know, increase our knowledge of these kinds of things, you know, um, and take responsibility, uh, get out of the habit. It's a totally new way to think about money, so we need to get out of the habit of 
this uh, comfortability with counterparty risk and trusting a third party. Uh, that's a hard thing to do. Um, if you dive in with both feet, you can do We seem to have lost Will there. It's also worth mentioning in on the topic of Bitcoin and security that Christoph Atlas gave a presentation for Bitcoin Philadelphia on how you can use cold storage, which is uh, in, in a way that's safer than a paper wallet. You can see the full video presentation if you want to learn how at bitcoinphl.com. Excellent. We have another comment from Forrest. He writes that Litecoin confirmations are not equal to Bitcoin confirmations. If you think three Bitcoin confirmations are fair, you should be requiring hundreds of Litecoin confirmations. It's not. It's just not an advantage for Litecoin. So he, he disagrees with the earlier statement about the confirmations. I do think the block time on Litecoin is faster. That's one of their large claims to fame. So we'll have to go to the info sheets about that. We'll have to look at it. I don't understand his reasoning. He's just asserting that they're not equal. Why? I, I'm believing that it might be something to do with the Litecoin network that just more confirmations are needed. Um, Why? I'm not sure. <laughs> we'll have to look it up. But we'll move on now to predictions. This is the part of the show where I ask you to predict the future. Are you ready? Derek J. No, I'm skip. Pass. Megan Lords. I'm ready this week. We're going to see medical marijuana dispensaries taking Bitcoin. Boom. Ooh. Will Pengman still frozen? Seems to be frozen, and we're moving back to you, Derek J. Uh, Bitcoin charities will be back in the news this time next week. And now, everyone knows about the altcoins that are already on BTC-E, but what about the altcoins that aren't on BTC-E yet? Which will be the next altcoin added to the major exchange? Megacoin? Worldcoin? Francocoin? Why not all three? We're out of time. Until next time, bye-bye.